John Agari's behavior was evident in his reaction to violent events. After a shooting ordered by him, Junior's first impulse was to drive back to the scene, eager to witness the aftermath. Junior's fascination was more about the thrill of the chaos than participating in the violence. Just like his father, John Gotti, who drove back to Paul Castellano's murder scene, Junior Gotti also had a taste for violence and murder. Murder of Georgie Grosso In the hell that is ruled by the Gottis, loyalty wasn't just a word, it was a way of life. For Junior Gotti, just like his father, John Gotti, loyalty was paramount. He expected nothing less from his associates, just as his father did before him. Junior's concerns went beyond just maintaining the family's criminal empire. He also fretted over its reputation. Individuals like Georgie Grosso, who sought to exploit the Gotti name for personal gain, raised red flags. Grosso's reckless behavior, including dabbling in drug dealing, threatened to tarnish the family's standing and attract unwanted heat from law enforcement. Drugs were a double-edged sword in Junior's world. While they promised quick cash, they also brought with them a host of problems. Junior worried about the loyalty of those involved in drug activities, fearing they might succumb to weakness or betray the family under pressure. Moreover, drug dealings could draw the wrong kind of attention, jeopardizing everything the family had built. Establishing authority was key for Junior as he stepped into his father's shoes. He knew he had to assert himself and delineate clear lines of command within the organization. Delegating responsibilities and setting communication channels, like directing matters through John Alight, helped him maintain control and discipline. Junior aspired for the family to expand its influence, much like the legendary figures of the underworld he admired. He saw men like Jimmy the Gent Burke and Joe German Watts as role models, powerful figures who commanded respect despite not being formally inducted into the Mafia. Money was the lifeblood of the Gambino family, and Junior understood the importance of safeguarding revenue streams. Even if individuals like Georgie Grosso weren't big earners, their actions could still impact the family's bottom line and reputation. But with every criminal enterprise came risks, and Junior was keenly aware of them. He emphasized the need to minimize exposure and avoid getting caught up in criminal cases. Junior, wary of Grosso potentially becoming a liability or even a rat, decided that Grosso's flaunting of the gaudy name had to be dealt with swiftly and decisively. Grosso's days were numbered. One fateful night, as Grosso unknowingly walked into his own demise, Grosso's arrogance and disregard for the rules had sealed his fate. In a display of power and retribution, Alight and his associate Frankie Burke confronted Grosso and his companion in a darkened alleyway. With tensions escalating and words turning to gunfire, Alight and Burke unleashed a barrage of bullets upon their unsuspecting targets. Grosso and his companion fell to the ground, their lives taken in an instant. Threats were a constant presence in Junior's world, and he met them head on. Whether it was addressing conflicts directly or making tough decisions about potential adversaries, Junior didn't hesitate to protect himself and his family. Every decision Junior made was strategic, aimed at preserving the family's power and influence. He weighed the potential consequences of his actions carefully, knowing that one wrong move could spell disaster for the Gambino Empire. But Junior had arrogance and took things personally. Jody It all began with a spark of disrespect. Junior's wife, Kim Gotti, was the center of his world, and any slight against her ignited a fire within him. When rumors spread of someone daring to speak ill of Kim, Junior's fury was unleashed. As Junior prowled the neighborhood streets, his anger simmered just below the surface. The mere sight of the young man who dared to disrespect his wife sent Junior into a frenzy. Junior's rage was not solely fueled by a desire to defend his wife's honor, it ran deeper than that. The young man in question was not just any stranger, but the boyfriend of Junior's sister-in-law, Jody. This personal connection only served to intensify Jody's need to assert his dominance. In a display of senseless bravado, Junior made a chilling decision. The young man's life would end at his command. He didn't hesitate to issue the order to kill, and not just kill the young man, but he wanted to hang him. 
but Junior wasn't content to simply give the order and wash his hands of the matter. No, he craved a hands-on approach, relishing the opportunity to wield his power directly and to boost his ego. He wanted to be the one to deliver the final blow, to feel the weight of his dominance firsthand. Plans were made and then changed, the details shifting to accommodate Junior's whims. Initially, the young man was to meet his fate in Staten Island, a remote location where Junior could ensure no one would interfere. But as the situation evolved, so too did Junior's plans. The young man's destination was altered, a new location on 104th Street chosen as the setting for his demise. As the night fell and the streets grew quiet, Junior's reign of terror reached its climax. The young man found himself in the clutches of Junior and his crew. What followed was a scene of brutality, a display of Junior's willingness to go to any lengths to maintain his reputation. The young man's screams echoed through the night as Junior and a light delivered blow after blow, his fists fueled by a mix of rage and pride. Despite the attempts of his associate Alight to reason with him, Junior remained resolute in his desire for vengeance. His stubbornness knew no bounds, his commitment to violence unwavering. To save the young man, John Alight invoked the memory of his deceased brother Frankie, drawing a parallel between the young man's age and that of his lost sibling. It was a twisted form of emotional manipulation to save the young man from the judgment Junior was about to unleash for something so simple. A moment of hesitation crept in. Perhaps influenced by a light's arguments or a flicker of conscience, Junior made a startling decision. He would spare the young man's life. Albanians It began with Junior's cousin, Johnny Boy Ruggiero who had gotten himself into a precarious situation. Johnny Boyd borrowed a hefty sum of $60,000 from a young Albanian woman named Janet, whom he'd been dating. But when Janet demanded her money back, Johnny Boy found himself in hot water. The Albanians, Janet's friends and relatives, weren't ones to take such matters lightly. They began to threaten Johnny Boy's life if he didn't return the money promptly. Junior, always on the lookout for an opportunity to make a quick buck, had likely gotten wind of Johnny Boy's shady dealings and decided to get involved. It wasn't beneath him to exploit such situations for his own gain. A light, a trusted associate, saw through Junior's facade, recognizing the move as a typical predator-type tactic that Junior either concocted himself or approved of. When Junior ordered a light's help to resolve the issue, it became clear just how out of his depth he was. After meeting on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, Junior attempted to posture himself as a tough and formidable force to reckon with. But Alight knew better. He understood the ruthless nature of the Albanians involved, who wouldn't hesitate to eliminate anyone standing in their way. Junior's bravado quickly crumbled in the face of reality. Threats and bluster were futile against adversaries who held all the cards. A light had to set him straight, reminding Junior that the Albanians wouldn't be swayed by empty threats. They were willing to go to any lengths to get what they wanted, even if it meant resorting to violence. Desperate to salvage the situation, Junior proposed a compromise, suggesting that perhaps the Albanian would accept a lesser amount than what was owed, but even this display of weakness was met with defiance. Through a light, the Albanian with a personal stake in the matter made it abundantly clear that there would be no negotiation. He wouldn't settle for a penny less than what was rightfully owed to Janet. In the end, Janet got her $60,000 back, but not without exposing Junior's true nature for all to see. His attempt to exploit a vulnerable situation had backfired, leaving him humiliated and diminished in the eyes of his crew. Gutterup's Murder Bruce Gutterup was another reckless gang member who sold drugs. His antics at Jägermeister's bar were causing headaches for everyone involved. He didn't care about shaking down the bar owner or robbing drug dealers. Gutterup openly defied the powerful Gotti crime family, showing no fear of retaliation. The Gottis, a name synonymous with power and ruthlessness, were not to be trifled with. But Gutterup didn't care. 
He openly expressed his disdain for them, boldly declaring, fuck Gotti. His brazen attitude only fueled the fire of conflict. Gotterup became a big problem for the Gotti crime family. Not only did he disrespect the Gotti name, but he was also driving away regular customers. People were terrified to be in the bar when Gotterup, high on drugs, showed up waving a gun and occasionally firing shots. There was also the matter of protection. A light, a member of the crew, had promised the bar owner protection in exchange for using the bar to move drugs. But with Gotterup's unpredictable behavior, the deal was under threat. Moreover, a light feared that Gotterup might turn his gun on someone in the crew or a light himself. A light had already dealt with dangerous situations before, like the incident with Grosso. He didn't want to be constantly on edge every time he walked into Jägermeister's. Neither did Junior. On November 20th, 1991, Gotterup showed up at Jägermeister's to collect his usual shakedown money. After collecting, he started drinking at the bar. Frankie Burke and King, two members of the crew, were already there, and they began drinking with him. It was all part of a plan. The three of them drank together and became friendly. Later that night, they decided to go clubbing. While driving toward Rockaway Beach, Gotterup mentioned that he needed to relieve himself. They pulled the car over, and Gotterup got out along the side of the road. As he was urinating, King quietly got out of the car, pulled out his gun, and shot Gotterup twice in the back of the head. Gotterup's body was found the next day. His murder sent a clear message. No one disrespects the Gottis. This act of violence also boosted Junior Gotti's ego. With his father in jail, Junior was now a leader of the biggest Cosa Nostra organization in New York, even if it was part of a ruling committee. Junior, also known as Junior, felt a surge of power. The family was his to lead, and he wanted to show everyone that he could handle it. The death of Gutterup was a statement of his authority and warning to anyone who dared to cross him or the Gotti name. Junior knew that maintaining control meant eliminating threats, and Gutterup had been a major one. With him out of the picture, Junior felt more secure in his position. The murder was just another step in solidifying his power and ensuring the loyalty and fear of those around him. Hit on Curtis Lewa. On June 19, 1992, a man named Curtis Lewa was kidnapped and shot by two gunmen after entering a stolen taxi in Manhattan. The taxi picked up Sliwa near his home in the East Village, and a gunman hiding in the front passenger seat jumped up and fired several shots, hitting him in the groin and legs. But he was known to many as the founder of the Guardian Angels and a radio talk show host. Curtis was no ordinary figure. He stood up against crime in the city and wasn't afraid to speak his mind, even if it meant challenging powerful individuals. But Curtis' bravery led him into a dangerous encounter. In a shocking turn of events, he found himself targeted by none other than John A. Gotti, the son of the infamous John J. Gotti, a notorious figure in organized crime. Junior wasn't someone to be trifled with. He was the heir of the Gambino crime family, following in his father's footsteps. When Junior ordered the hit on Curtis, it wasn't just a matter of business. It was personal. Curtis had dared to speak out against the Gotti family on his radio show, branding John J. Gotti as public enemy number one. The attack on Curtis was ruthless. Two gunmen, associates of the Gambino crime family, were sent to silence him. They intercepted Curtis while he was riding in a stolen cab, and without warning, one of the gunmen, Michael Yanati, opened fire, hitting Curtis multiple times. But Curtis' spirit couldn't be dampened so easily. Despite sustaining severe injuries, including gunshot wounds to his chest and legs, he summoned all his strength and managed to escape from the cab. It was a miraculous survival Curtis escaped due to perhaps a touch of divine intervention or a guardian angel. The aftermath of the attack brought Junior Gotti and his cohorts under the scrutiny of law enforcement. Federal prosecutors in Manhattan used this incident in 2004 to bring an 11-count racketeering indictment against Junior and his associates. The charges ranged from murder and kidnapping to loan sharking and extortion, painting a grim picture of the criminal activities orchestrated by Junior and his ilk. 
to build their case, prosecutors relied on a cooperating witness named Michael DeLeonardo, also known as Mickey Scars, a former capo in the Gambino crime family. His insider knowledge provided crucial evidence against Junior and his associates, cementing the case against them. Despite the overwhelming evidence, Junior and his crew remained defiant. They pleaded not guilty during their arraignments in federal district court, showing no sign of remorse for their actions. It was clear that Junior's grip on the criminal underworld was tight, and he wasn't going down without a fight. As the legal proceedings unfolded, the true extent of Junior's dangerous nature became apparent. He was willing to go to any lengths to protect his family's legacy and maintain control over the criminal empire they'd built. Junior's cold and calculated demeanor sent shivers down the spines of those who dared to oppose him. Junior faced a potential sentence of up to 130 years in prison if convicted, but his influence was large over the proceedings. The shadow of the Gambino family cast a long and menacing silhouette over the courtroom. As the trial of Junior continued, the courtroom buzzed with tension and intrigue. Junior's defense lawyer, Charles Carnesi, made a startling assertion, claiming that his client was the heir apparent to the Gambino organized crime family in 1992. This bold statement sent shockwaves through the courtroom, violating the sacred code of silence that typically shrouded the Mafia's activities. The prosecution, led by Michael McGovern, wasted no time in painting a chilling picture of Junior's alleged involvement in criminal activities, comparing his supposed withdrawal from the Mafia to a heavy drinker's empty promise to quit after a hangover. With no corroborating witnesses from the Mafia to support Junior's defense, the prosecution's argument seemed to carry significant weight. Judge Shira A. Scheindlin instructed the jury carefully, emphasizing that it was the defense's responsibility to prove Junior's complete dissociation from the crime family after 1999. The burden of proof lay squarely on the shoulders of Junior's legal team, adding to the pressure mounting in the courtroom. Throughout the trial, departures from the norms of traditional legal proceedings continued to unfold. Witnesses revealed shocking revelations about secret initiation rites and familial ties to the Mafia, painting a vivid picture of the Mafia Junior was allegedly a part of. Despite the gravity of the accusations against him, Junior remained stoic, his demeanor betraying no hint of remorse or fear. McGovern's arguments were compelling, citing examples of Junior's continued involvement in criminal activities, such as using a Mafia lawyer to send messages and profiting from properties purchased with alleged Gambino money. The prosecution's case seemed ironclad, leaving Junior's defense scrambling to counter the mounting evidence against their client. As the trial neared its conclusion, the statute of limitations loomed large over the proceedings. Junior could only be convicted if the jury believed he was part of a racketeering conspiracy within five years of the indictment. The stakes were high, and the outcome of the trial hung in the balance. Despite the defense's efforts to shift the burden of proof onto the prosecution, doubts lingered in the minds of the jury. Junior's financial transactions and alleged ties to organized crime cast a shadow over his claims of withdrawal from the Mafia. As the trial drew to a close, one thing became abundantly clear. Junior Gotti was not a man to be underestimated. Junior walked out as a free man. Present Life In 1999, Junior was imprisoned for racketeering. Between 2004 and 2009, he underwent four racketeering trials, all of which resulted in mistrials. In January 2010, federal prosecutors decided to drop the charges against him. By December 2010, after his legal battles concluded, Junior returned to his home in the village of Oyster Bay, Long Island, at the age of 47. Despite his past involvement in organized crime, he's married to Kimberly Albanese and they have six children, whose ages range from 4 to 20 years old. Junior claims to have left his mafia life behind, but admits to missing certain aspects of his former lifestyle. He nostalgically recalls the glamour, camaraderie, and attention that the streets once offered him. 
However, he emphasizes that he no longer follows the strict code of the streets. He insists that he's adopted a more open-minded approach and distanced himself from his past criminal activities. Currently, Junior lives on a two-acre estate equipped with a swimming pool and stables. He maintains that the property was bought with income from legitimate businesses. Despite the appearance of wealth, he claims that the property is heavily mortgaged and he faces significant debt, primarily due to mounting legal expenses. Despite financial difficulties, Junior and his family manage to get by with income from their commercial real estate properties, making Gotti Jr. a landlord in New York City. He remains dedicated to providing for his family and building a new life despite his troubled past. The Gambino crime family, once led by his father John Gotti, has experienced significant leadership changes recently. Frank Kelly was the head of the Gambino crime family until his death in May 2019, after which reports suggested that Lorenzo Manino stepped in to handle leadership duties, though he was not officially the boss. In 2021, another leadership shift occurred within the Gambino crime family when Domenico Cefalu, an Italian-American mobster with deep connections to the organization, became the new boss. Cefalu's rise to power marks a crucial development for the family, giving him significant control over its criminal activities. Under Domenico Cefalu's leadership, the Gambino crime family is entering a new phase, which could alter the dynamics of organized crime in New York City and beyond. This transition highlights the family's resilience and adaptability, maintaining its influence within the criminal underworld. In September 2010, Fiore Films secured the rights from Junior to produce a movie about his life, emphasizing his relationship with his father. Despite interest from various producers, Junior chose Fiore, a newly established company. The film, initially titled Gotti in the Shadow of My Father, was set to be directed by Barry Levinson. John Travolta was cast as Gotti Sr. and Spencer LaFranco was cast as Junior Gotti. The film was later renamed Gotti and directed by Kevin Connolly. Additionally, on June 9, 2018, the documentary TV series Gotti, Godfather and Son was released, providing more insights into the Gotti family's history. In November 2013, violence returned to John Gotti Jr.'s life when he was stabbed while intervening in a fight in Syosset, New York. Despite these dangers, Jr. remained resilient. In 2015, he published a book titled Shadow of My Father, which offers insights into his life and experiences. These events highlight the ongoing challenges and complexities he's faced, both personally and as a figure in organized crime. John Gotti III, Junior's son and the grandson of the notorious New York mob boss John Gotti, is set to face boxing legend Floyd Mayweather Jr. in the ring. This much-anticipated match, promoted as Last Names Matter, will take place in Florida. Gotti III, with a background in mixed martial arts or MMA, has an impressive record of five wins and one loss in MMA, and an undefeated streak of two wins as a professional boxer. With his father, John Jr. Gotti, supporting him, Gotti III is eager to demonstrate his skills and determination in the ring, aiming to prove himself against one of boxing's most iconic figures, Floyd Mayweather Jr.